Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft, welcoming you to our live five days a week look into all things Oakland County. Today, we'll be talking to our elected leaders, medical professionals, activity influencers, and one of Michigan's remarkable charities and nonprofits. We hope you enjoy the show. The Oakland County Megacast is broadcast on a variety of television, radio, and web outlets, including our flagship, flagship stations, Civic Center TV, 89.3, Lakes FM, and My Michigan TV. All of that information can be found on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast where you'll also find all of our programs on demand and find each individual interview as well civiccentertv.com slash megacast for more information then let's head over to our news page at civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news or by clicking our local news link at the top of the homepage. We have links to the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from reliable and expert resources at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Oakland County Health Division to help keep you up to date on everything that you need to know about the spread of COVID-19, precautionary tactics that you may need to employ in your daily life, such as masking or distancing, as well as vaccinations and booster shots. Also on our news page at civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news, we feature articles from many journalistic outlets throughout the state of Michigan in order to keep you updated on COVID-19 and other stories making headlines throughout the Great Lakes state. Our top story today is from the Detroit Free Press's Teresa Baldas, Oxford High School, uh, the Oxford High School shooting suspect's trial may be delayed as much as four months. Yesterday on the program, we talked about prosecutor's office in Oakland County wanting to hide some, well, not hide, but uh, restrict the release of some of this, uh, some of the evidence from the Oxford High School sh uh, shooting in November. And that may be causing some delays. The murder trial of school shooting suspect uh, from Oxford has been delayed by four months as his defense team convinced the judge on Thursday that it needed more time to go through the massive amount of evidence in the case. The decision to move the teenager's mur murder trial from September to January came one day after another judge ordered the release of all evidence held by Oakland County Sheriff's Office relating to the November 30th massacre, including surveillance video of the shooting itself. The evidence is being released at the request of the families of two students who died in the shooting, those being the families of Tate Mir and Justin Schilling, and three other students who, are survi who survived but were traumatized by the massacre. Those families have filed a civil lawsuit over the shooting against various school officials, though Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald has said she plans to intervene in the case to prevent the release of the video and other evidence. The prosecutor's office is concerned about the release of the video, that it could encourage other school shootings, and that disclosing other evidence could impact the ongoing criminal cases involving the alleged shooter and his parents, Jennifer and James. Crumbly, who are charged with involuntary manslaughter for their alleged roles in the shooting. Prosecutors allege that the Crumblies ignored warning signs that their son was spiraling out of control, and instead of getting him medical help, they bought him a gun, the same gun that he allegedly used in the shooting on November 30th. The Crumblies and their son are being held in the Oakland County Jail, though they are not allowed to communicate with one another. Their son's trial was scheduled to begin in September, but now has been pushed to begin on January 17th of 2023, when a jury will decide the fate of the 16-year-old who was charged in the deaths of four students and the wounding of six students and a teacher. The shooter, who was 15 at the time of the massacre, attended a pre-trial he hearing on Thursday morning via Zoom from the Oakland County Jail. Previous efforts to have him moved to a juvenile facility have failed with Oakland County Circuit Court Judge Kwame Rowe concluding jail is the most suitable place for this individual. Because he is a juvenile housed in an adult jail, federal law mandates that a hearing be held every month to make sure his his physical, educational, and emotional needs are met without compromising his safety. At Thursday's hearing, the judge concluded that the teen's, the teen's need uh, needs are being met in jail and that his current incarceration status is still appropriate. Uh, the alleged shooter's next hearing is scheduled for 9 a.m. on July 21st. Also making headlines on a website today at civiccentertv.com on the local news page from U Stella U of Bridge, Michigan. Michigan Democrats are lobbying to move up the state's primary, the, the uh, Michigan's diversity status as a battleground state and affordability to political candidates should make the state among the first to hold presidential primaries in 2024. That was the pitch on Thursday from Michigan's top Democrats as they pleaded with the National Democratic committee on Thursday to tweak the primary calendar. Michigan is among more than a dozen states and territories fighting to move up the DNC's presidential primaries calendar, a change that could increase economic investment and political power. 
The DNC must decide by August 6th, that's Michigan's, uh, Michigan's proposal, has gained support from prominent Democrats in the state, such as U.S. Representative Debbie Dingell and Senator Debbie Stabenow, both of whom spoke at the Thursday DNC meeting in Washington, D.C. Two ex-state GOP chairs, Rusty Hills and Saul Anousis, drafted a letter to the DNC ex expressing their support as well, hailing Michigan as a, quote-unquote, affordable state with a diverse voter base. Quote, simply put, Michigan is America and America is Michigan, the former GOP chairperson wrote, a uh, chairpersons wrote. But to move up the primary dates would require uh, assent from Michigan's Republican-led state legislature, which also has been non-committal so far. In 2020, Michigan held its presidential primaries on March 10th, a week after Super Tuesday, when one-third of all presidential nominating delegates are up for grabs, and five weeks after the the first in the nation, Iowa caucuses. At the Thursday event, Dingell told the DNC, quote, appropriate conversations and closed, quote, are underway with the legislature, but was not willing to discuss those details. Quote, we feel good about the conversations that have been had so far, said Michigan Democratic Party Chairperson Labora Barnes to the DNC on Thursday. Quote, we just aren't ready to put out those conversations publicly, end close quote. Senate Majority Mike, Leader Mike Shirky, a Republican from Clark Lake, said, quote, uh, quote, has not discussed this with Democrats yet, and, ha and no bill has been introduced to make the change, and closed quote, said spokesperson Matt Sweeney to Bridge, Michigan, in a text. House Speaker Jason Wentworth's spokesperson told Bridge that the Speaker, quote, hasn't spoken to them about it either. Uh, continuing on, states among the earliest to hold presidential primaries have traditionally wielded significant influence over the trajectory of the race. Those primary results help, quote-unquote, winnow the field of candidates and draw media attention and campaign spending to the, those first states. Matt Grossman, political science professor at Michigan State University, told Bridge, Michigan, quote, traditionally that process has been mostly reducing the number of candidates, he said. It wasn't necessarily seen as Iowa and New Hampshire get to pick the winner, end close quote. Those who perform well in early primary states do not always win presidential elections or even the primaries, Grossman wrote. In uh, 2020, Pete Buttigieg won Iowa and Bernie Sanders swept in New Hampshire, but both dropped out of the race eventually, he said. Michigan Democrats have long fought to be among the first to hold primaries. Dingell, who represents most of Washtenaw and Wayne counties, lobbied the ne Democratic National Committee to reevaluate its nominating calendar all the way back in 2005, although Michigan failed to make the cut Roll Call reported. The National Party again fully opened its nominating process this year after Iowa faced backlash in 2020 for delays in caucus results and for its lack of racial diversity. The states have also been criticized for exerting an outsized influence while not representing the majority of American voters. Quote, Iowa and New Hampshire happen to be among the, the whitest states and among the most liberal states in the Democratic electorate, in closed quote, said Grossman. Michigan, in, in contrast, is the middle of the pack among states when it comes to diversity as 25% of voting age residents are non-white. The effort to move Michigan up a calendar on the calendar has support from groups such as the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, the Michigan Manufacturers Association, and Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association, said Dingle on Thursday. Quote, people are clamoring to join us, and closed quote, she said. In an opinion, opinion published in the Detroit News, uh, Saul Anousis called Michigan, quote, the most diverse battleground state and a microcosm of America, and closed quote, and argued that the nomination would bring Michigan, quote, a tremendous economic benefit, and closed quote, by drawing campaign investments in small businesses, hotel rest, hotels, restaurants, and tech companies. Quote, this isn't a Republican or Democratic issue, he wrote. This is about Michigan getting more attention, more understanding of the issues that affect our state, and being representative of the people and issues that affect our country. Finally, making headlines on CivicCenterTV.com on our local news page from Mark Hicks of the Detroit News. Kisa, Detroit Zoo's oldest tiger, unfortunately, has passed away at the age of 18. The Detroit Zoo has lost its oldest tiger, officials announced on Thursday, saying, quote, we are heartbroken to announce the passing of Kisa, a beloved uh, Amur tiger, and close quote, the zoo said in a statement via Facebook. Uh, the statement continued on by saying, quote, she passed during a veterinary procedure meant to, to manage Kisa's arthritis symptoms and improve her quality of life, end closed quote. Born on August 12, 2003 at the Royal Oak Zoo, she was uh, eldest in the Devereux Tiger Forest, a habitat she shared with Nikolai and Amelia, according to the notice. Life expectancy for more tigers, formerly known as Siberian tigers, is 10 to 15 years in the wild, according to the zoo. The Devereux habitat opened in 2019 on one acre across from the zoo's Holtzman Wildlife Foundation Red Panda Forest. Kisa, which means kitty in Russian, 
quote, loved taking long walks through her home, especially if there was snow on the ground, end close quote, the zoo said on Thursday. Quote, associate curator of mammals, Betsy Meister describes Kisa as an individual who followed her own set of rules despite being known for her spirited attitude. She was mild mannered with animal care staff and has always been a favorite among those who worked with her for nearly two decades, end closed quote. Animal care and veterinary staff members had been monitoring and treating Kisa's age-related ailments. She also had been uh, on three medications, quote, to help keep her comfortable in her later years, and close quote, according to the zoo. Quote, her absence leaves a hole in our hearts and she will be missed by staff and guests alike, and close quote, the statement said, and that statement via the Detroit Zoo's Facebook page. All those headlines are on our website at civiccentertv.com on our local news page, civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news, as well as those ever helpful links at the top of the page through COVID-19 information that's up to date and accurate from experts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great program ahead on this Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Up next, we'll be joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro, and then at the bottom of the hour, Representative Andy Levin will join us. That's all up next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Uh why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date.
Welcome back to the Oakland County MegaCast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Oakland County. I'm your host, Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the program is one of over 300 shared Detroit-supported charities and nonprofits. Leon Judd is the president of NAMI Metro, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and joins us now on the MegaCast. Leon, thank you very much for being with us today. Glad to have you with us. Tell us first about uh, a little bit about yourself, how you got connected with NAMI Metro, and then about your organization. Yeah, so uh, I am the volunteer president of uh, NAMI Metro and uh, the founder of uh, the organization. Uh, I had 34 years with uh, the National uh, Steel Corporation and uh, retired as uh, vice president of human resources. And then the next day became president of an international IT company headquartered in uh, Germany, but to run the U.S. operations. And uh, so in terms of how I got connected with uh, mental illness uh, is a personal story. Uh, I have uh, a son who was uh, 17 when we dropped him off at the University of Pittsburgh Honors Engineering School, Engineering Physics on an academic scholarship. And in his sophomore year, he had a complete psychotic break and that was the introduction uh, to mental illness that my wife and I and my son had and my daughter uh, to mental illness. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time. First five years were horrible. Um, a lot's went on in those five years before uh, insight was uh, uh, accepted. And then treatment came and the excellent treatment that he's had. He's 47 today, doing very well, went back, got his undergraduate degree, got his master's degree. He's a cybersecurity analyst today. And uh, so because there was very little available for family members uh, during that time, the, uh, the establishment of NAMI Metro allowed us to provide a lot of education and support and advocacy for family members who had a loved one with a mental illness. We're joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro, joining us on the Michigan MegaCast. More information can be found on NAMIMetro.com. And so uh, you mentioned you're the volunteer president of this organization. To what extent are you working with this organization to uh, ensure that it's providing these programs and developing new programs that are meeting the needs of the mental health of people in the metro area? Uh, great question. Uh, so NAMI and all of NAMIs across the country do three things fundamentally. That's education, support, and advocacy for family members as well as individuals who are struggling with a mental health condition. So uh, we have established uh, quite a, an array of support groups for family members as well as individuals. And then the other thing that we do in addition to the education programs that we provide, uh, we have a lot of presentations that we do in the community. Uh, we go into businesses, we go into middle schools, high schools, uh, anywhere that is interested in uh, learning more about uh, mental health awareness, uh, what some of the signs and the symptoms are, what they can do, and just to learn more about what might be available in the community through NAMI Metro and others. And the other is, is acting as advocates through our helplines. Uh, we're able to get people directed to the kinds of services uh, that we think they might be needing. Uh, we are an all-volunteer organization, like I mentioned earlier, so uh, we have no office. Uh, all the work that we do is through our homes or into the hospitals, uh, which are temporarily, because of the pandemic, a little bit hard to uh, make contact with. So we're hoping that uh, that uh, breaks loose and we can move from the Zoom meetings that we're currently doing to face-to-face, uh, -face, which uh, is uh, certainly much more personal than, uh, than the Zoom. So among the many programs provided by NAMI Metro and, and provided by NAMIs throughout the U.S. Uh, is the Families in Action program. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about the Families in Action program, what services it provides uh, to families and to individuals with suffering from mental illness, and uh, how people can access this program? Yeah, uh, Tyler, the Families in Action program is a 10-week family education program that meets 10 consecutive Wednesdays uh, and each week is a different educational uh, session. 
It is also put on by family members uh, who have lived experience uh, to other family members who are going through some of the struggles. We have put over 2,500 family members through this educational program. This was something that was not available when uh, this first uh, uh, came to light with uh, my wife and I. So it was one of the things that was really on our radar screen to, to bring and make available for family members to help them get early education as to what they can do. The overall objective of the Families in Action is to help your loved one be healthy, happy, and independent. And uh, we've had nothing but positive feedback over the years uh, as a result of doing that, uh, those classes. We do it twice a year in the spring and in the fall. Uh, the next class uh, starts uh, September 7th. It'll be done on Zoom again. Uh, because we're still not able to get back into the hospital where we typically would do the family class. The advantage is, is that we have people that are able to come to the class that wouldn't normally be able to. Either they can't drive at night or there are some people are even uh, zooming in from Florida, uh, Ohio, other states where they have loved ones here in Michigan, but they're actually physically in another location. So uh, it really does teach some really good tools and skills for family members to help them uh, better deal with and help their loved one who uh, may be having some serious problems in communications and getting along and those sorts of things. We're joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro on the Michigan Megacast. More information can be found about NAMI Metro by visiting its website at namimetro.org. That's namimetro.org. And so for those that are interested in the Families in Action program and would like to join in on the next meeting of that program or are interested in other programs through NAMI Metro, what, uh, what steps do they need to take to either sign themselves up individually or sign up a family member, another loved one, or help them with that signing up process for any of these programs? Yeah, the Families in Action is for the family members or caregivers uh, specifically, and they can do it in two ways. Uh, they can either go online to namimetro.org, and on the resource tab of that uh, website, you'll see something called Families in Action. There's a brochure that outlines the 10 weeks and an application form to get registered, or else they can uh, email me at leonj at namimetro.org and uh, let me know that they're interested and uh, we can get them on the uh, waiting list. We already have people on the waiting list started out for a September 7th class. These have always filled up. Uh, so uh, they're obviously of uh, help, but a lot of word of mouth is uh, what helps in uh, getting other family members to uh, register for the class. We're joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro, serving the communities um, of Metro, Macomb, Wayne, and Oakland counties in the state of Michigan. More information can be found at namimetro.org. That's namimetro.org. And, and so what sort of affiliation does your organization have or relationship does your organization have, this more localized uh, uh, chapter of NAMI, with the national organization? How does that communication then help to provide even better support to those in Metro, Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County? Yeah, NAMI National is the largest mental health advocacy organization in the country. There is, a, there is a, an office in every state in, in Michigan. It's in Lansing. And we have 12 affiliates across the state of Michigan, including the UP. And NAMI Metro, Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County uh, is the one that, it, that covers uh, those three counties. The interesting thing or the good thing about NAMI as a national organization is we, they provide the training for the signature programs uh, that are out there for support groups for the presentations like Ending the Silence that's taken into middle and high schools, like In Our Own Voice, which is a program where it's presented to businesses, colleges, universities. And so those programs are going to be the same no matter if you're in Michigan or if you're in California or if you're in Florida, uh, people are going to be trained with the similar processes for these uh, evidence-based programs. So uh, we also do things locally here specifically. Uh, we'll get calls uh, because it's Mental Health Awareness Month. We've had 16 events in the month of, uh, in, in this month alone in May. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest, but we can also customize presentations. We may get a call from somebody wanting to do a presentation on 
teen depression or suicide prevention. So those are things that we can put together and uh, bring to the community uh, based on what it is that they have a specific interest in. More information on programs, support groups, and the In Our Own Voice program as well by visiting namimetro.org. That's namimetro.org for more information. We're joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro on the Michigan Megacast. And so uh, as you're talking about these programs, you mentioned the, the training that goes into these programs. What sort of uh, volunteer opportunities are there for people if they would like to help the organization on a volunteer basis and, and don't necessarily have a need for or are seeking the services of NAMI Metro? Yeah, we get people trained to be support group leaders for family support groups as well as uh, uh, what we call connection peer-led support groups. Uh, these are, everything that NAMI does, I think I, sh I should have mentioned this, is peer-led. So if it's a family program, either education or support group, it is run by a family member who has a loved one with a mental illness. So it's lived experience, different than a professional, for example. Both are important, but uh, different, uh, different approaches and different understandings. The other is if it's a program for someone who is struggling with a mental health condition, those programs are run by individuals who are in recovery and have been trained to either run a support group or do some of the presentations that uh, are put out by NAMI or some of the education. So we have quite a few people trained uh, in uh, like in our own voice and some of the presentations. We're always uh, looking for people who are in recovery, who can be, who are comfortable with being a facilitator uh, and trained to be a leader. So you have to be a member of NAMI Metro number one, and that's really simple and very inexpensive uh, to be. And uh, you become a member actually of the state organization as well as the national organization, and you get communications from all of those organizations uh, if you are a member. The one area that is very difficult for us to find volunteers for and get trained are young people who are in recovery from mental illness. There is a program called Ending the Silence that we have that requires two presenters. One is a family member and one is an individual, a young person uh, who has got lived experience that is willing to tell their story in a fashion that is uh, laid out by NAMI National. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard. I think young people have a difficult time coming forward about uh, their uh, recovery story. Uh, but uh, we'll typically get one or two, but we're always looking for those people. And we're always looking for uh, people in recovery that are going to be uh, comfortable in being a facilitator or a support group leader. This training that uh, comes about is typically done twice a year. NAMI Michigan puts that training on. So it's in the spring and in the fall. And then we're kind of uh, at, their, uh, at their beck and call in terms of what trainings they're going to be putting on uh, each uh, in the spring and in the, in the fall. But uh, those are the two areas probably where we have the, the biggest need. Uh, we, have, we have people there now, but we can always use more in those two categories. That's support group leaders and young people uh, to be trained to be ending the silence presenters. We're joined by Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information on NAMI Metro can, join, can be found at namimetro.org. That's namimetro.org. Leon, uh, what are some other ways that if people would like to support NAMI Metro at this time, that they can uh, support the organization, the work that it does, uh, facilitating these programs and these support groups for those suffering uh, or in recovery from mental illness in the local area? Yeah, the, uh, going to the website is probably one of the best ways, uh, namimetro.org. There's an announcements page, and there's a lot, of, a lot of great information. On the resource page, on the information links, we have, uh, we have probably too many links uh, for resources there. But the two things that are coming up, uh, July 31st, uh, there is a fundraiser that is going to be the 17th year for that fundraiser. It's called Skins and Pins information you can get on it and sign up at skins and pins all one word dot org and uh, it is the last Sunday of July always so it'll be July 31st we're always looking for sponsors and we're always looking for teams to sign up uh, for that program 
It's being held at Fox Hills uh, Golf and Banquet Center in Plymouth, Michigan. And uh, so we're in the midst right now, working hard at getting ready for, uh, for that to happen. The other thing that happens uh, every year is the NAMI Michigan Walk. Uh, NAMI Metro has always got a large group of walkers. Uh, that walk is uh, designed to raise awareness and raise funding uh, for the affiliates and the state to be able to carry out the duties that uh, they do, especially when you're an all-volunteer organization. We have a lot of requirements in that we don't have an office. All the money, just so you know, in NAMI Metro goes towards providing all the materials and the classes and the trainings that are needed right back into the organization. So we have no rent, we have no salaries, we have no uh, utilities. So the only operating is like our helplines and those kinds of things that we have. But uh, the NAMI walk is going to be on uh, September, I'm not sure, I think it's, it's, September 24th, I'm sorry. It's gonna be September 24th and this year, rather than at Belle Isle, the walk is gonna be at Wayne State University. So we would encourage everybody to, uh, to sign up. Uh, it'll soon be available for you to sign up uh, on uh, namimetro.org and also NAMI Michigan. We're just getting the, uh, the links put in place now to be able to do that. But I would encourage you if you sign up, please sign up for NAMI Metro. And uh, we have a wonderful t-shirt that we'll give you if you're a first time walker with us. And it's a yellow shirt with a big skunk on it that says stigma stinks. And that's one of the things that we're always fighting to do is to kind of eradicate the stigma uh, because we're trying to make the quality of life for individuals and family members uh, in this uh, world of mental health uh, get destigmatized because there's still a lot of stigma around mental illness. Leon, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, good to be here, Tyler. Thank you. Appreciate having you on. Leon Judd, the president of NAMI Metro, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You can find more information on NAMI Metro by visiting Share Detroit's website at sharedetroit.org. Before we go to break, we do have breaking news, making headlines across the U.S. at this time. And this has been confirmed by both CBS, ABC, NPR, Fox News, and the Associated Press. The Supreme Court has officially struck down uh, Roe versus Wade in a decision uh, that, that happened just earlier on this morning. The decision uh, that, that overturned this ruling was in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization on Friday. Uh, the votes in favor of striking down this, me this historic measure were from Justices Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Co uh, Coney Barrett uh, in dissent were Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. Uh, of course, those three being from the more liberal wing of the Supreme Court. So in a decision uh, today, when, in a decision today uh, by a vote uh, by a vote of just three dissenting voices and the re remainder of the court uh, in affirmation, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade uh, in, by, by way of their decision in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization on Friday. This has been uh, this has been corroborated and has been confirmed by several other news organizations across Michigan and across the U.S. We will have Representative Andy Levin on uh, just a little bit after 11 o'clock as we begin the Michigan Megacast to get his reaction uh, and, of course, the reaction from some of the people, particularly on the more liberal wing of our, of our federal government uh, at 11 o'clock. Stay tuned here to the, Michi to the Oakland County and Michigan Megacasts for more coverage on that with, with Representative Andy Levin. You're not going to want to miss that discussion. We are going to take a break in the Meantime, we'll come back with more of the Oakland County Megacast. After this break, we'll be speaking to Tessa Benzinger from Walking Lightly in Ferndale. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. 
We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments. Made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Oakland County. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program by visiting civicstandardtv.com and clicking on our Megacast link where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Well, there's so many different reasons why I could say you might think that I'm crazy, and I'll give you one statement that will definitely make you think that I'm a little bit off my rocker. What if there was a way that you could have the same bottle of shampoo and never run out of shampoo in that bottle. There is a way to do that sustainably so you don't have to keep throwing that bottle out or throwing out your soap bottles or other materials that are contained in plastic. Joining us now on the Oakland County MechaCast is Tessa Benzinger, the owner of Walking Lightly in Ferndale. Tessa, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, of course. So the store itself offers uh, home and body products and in bulk. So customers are welcome to bring in their own containers, anything clean and dry and just fill up the products that you need every day, like soaps, shampoos, laundry soap, dish soap, personal items, things like that. Um, that way you can get the things you need for your home without using any more single use plastics, uh, which is really the focus of the store is eliminating all the single use plastics that we can. Um, just in my own personal life, I was really struggling to find a way to reduce our household plastic. Um, and I figured there had to be a better way and that my neighbors must be in the same situation. So it all grew out of that. So these products that you're, that you're, that you're selling there that you're providing to be able to help these individuals refill some of their soap bottles, their shampoo bottles, their conditioner bottles, and, and so on. Uh, are those being made by your company? Are those the products that you're bringing in? And, and how do you do that in a way that's also sustainable? Because I would imagine that the packaging for those is also plastic. Right. Yeah, and we certainly don't want to be contributing to the waste stream on the back end. Um, so we are not the manufacturer. Um, we work with suppliers who are closed loop. So they ship their products to us in a container that they take back. Um, so for a lot of a lot of our uh, suppliers, that'll be like in a plastic bag. Everything gets rinsed and then sent back to the supplier to just keep in the supply chain for as long as possible. And so. Uh Tessa, many may have the question, well, you know, I, a lot of these containers that, that 
these products are coming in are plastic, sure, but I can put them in the recycling bin, and it's all fine. It's all getting recycled and repopulated anyway. Why do I need to go to a business like that? Is that a flawed mode of thinking, and, and for what reason would that maybe be flawed? Well, in the last several years, we certainly learned that recycling is not maybe the golden ticket that we once thought it was. Um, overall, the recycling rates are about 9%. Um, and even with plastics that can be recycled, they can't be recycled infinitely. So a new or virgin plastic can be, depending on which number of plastic it is, can be recycled maybe once or twice. But at the end of, of those couple of trips through the system, it's going to go in the landfill or to be burned, both of which are not good options. Um, yeah, so we felt like there, there needed to be a better option. We're joined by Tessa Bensinger, the owner of Walking Lightly, located in Ferndale, Michigan, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Uh, Tessa, your business is called Walking Lightly. What was the inspiration behind that name specifically for your business? So it's kind of funny when I was um, when I was a kid, I had a poster on my wall with a picture of the earth and a quote from Barbara Ward. And it, the quote is, we have forgotten how to be good guests, how to walk lightly on the earth as its other creatures do. And when I decided to do this, I'm not sure why, but that popped into my head. So just kind of feels full circle. <laughs> More information on their website, walkinglightly.net. That's walkinglightly.net. Uh, for more information, look at some of their products and to get in contact with the folks over at Walking Lightly, located in Ferndale, Michigan. We're joined by Tessa Benzinger, the owner of Walking Lightly, located in Ferndale. Uh, your, your, uh, your business offers local delivery using deposit jars for home and body, f uh, body goods as well. Can you talk about those deposit jars and, and how vast they are in your delivery area? Yeah, so it's sort of... When, when we first started doing this, I think that was the easiest transition and it was easiest to be able to compare it to the milkman for people. So um, that's why we use the deposit jar system because we can all sort of imagine what it was like when milk bottle. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine.
Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. Thank you for tuning in to our live daily one-hour show about all things Oakland County. Learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Uh, of course, uh, this morning, uh, this Friday morning, there's breaking news in Washington, D.C., where the Supreme Court has struck down Roe versus Wade in a decision in which there were only three dissenting opinions on the Supreme Court court proper. Uh, this decision comes at the dis uh, after the court made its final decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization on Friday. Of course, just a couple of months ago, there was a leak from Justice Samuel Alito's office on a draft opinion from the majority on, on the court in this decision. And now that decision is official across the U.S. The Supreme Court decision has struck down the 19 uh, 90, 1992 law in which uh, Roe versus Wade was once again upheld, and and in some of the uh, discussion of this, and some of the opinions that were that were written in the final opinion on Friday, uh, Justice Alito in in particular referenced the 1992 case Roe and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 decision that reaffirmed Roe versus Wade that was. Uh, of course, affirmed years prior in the Supreme Court. And in this opinion, he wrote the, the following. This is in an article uh, from Mark Sherman of AP of the Associated Press. You can find it at apnews.com. Alito wrote that the final opinion issued on Friday wrote uh, that Roe and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 decision that reaffirmed the right to a, abortion were wrong the day that they were decided and must be overturned. Uh, Justice Alito said, quote, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision and closed quote. Of course, uh, as marked in the article, joining Justice Alito affirming this decision in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, where Justices Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, and it should be referenced that those are all justices that were nominated uh, and confirmed to the court during uh, a Republican president's administration. The three dissenters of this decision were, just, were uh, Justices Sonia Sotomayor, uh, Justice Elena Kagan and Justice Stephen Breyer, who all were nominated and confirmed during the presidency of a Democrat. So uh, 
right on so-called party lines, although we should reference the Supreme Court is a nonpartisan wing of the United States federal government. Uh, they are nominated by uh, political affil affiliated individuals, that being the president of the United States, and typically will share the political leanings of said president. In this case, that is the current uh, that is the current look of the Supreme Court with six Democrats. Let's say with, uh, yeah, with, with mostly Democrats in the minority. My apologies on the court again. The Associated Press, as well as other news organizations, including CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox, and NPR, all uh, confirming that the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade in a decision in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization uh, earlier on this morning. Uh, 1973 ruling that guaranteed federal constitutional protections of abortion rights, Roe versus Wade, thereby overturned in that case. Uh, and so, uh, definitely going to be significant reaction across the U.S. on that front. We will speak to Representative Andy Levin coming up shortly, and we'll get his reaction from the Michigan wing of the federal government from the House of Representatives. He's currently our representative for the 9th Congressional District. In the meantime, we'll take a break. We'll come back on your radio homes for the Megacast 89.3 WBLB Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills, and we'll kick off the Michigan Megacast with Dr. Russell Faust from the Oakland County Health Division and get an update on COVID-19 and more in Oakland County and across the state. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24 seven. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome to the Michigan MegaCast. I'm Tyler Keith, welcoming you to our live five days a week, one hour look into all things Michigan. We'll be taking, in this, in this hour of the program, we'll be talking to elected leaders as well as medical professor, professionals, uh, activity influencers, and Michigan's remarkable char charities and nonprofits. We hope you enjoy the program ahead. The Michigan MegaCast is broadcast on a variety of television, radio, and web outlets across the state of Michigan, including My Michigan TV, a free smart TV, smartphone, and web streaming site dedicated to covering the entire Great Lakes state. Joining us now on the program as the COVID-19 pandemic continues on at another and different pace is Dr. Russell Faust, Medical Director of the Oakland County Health Division. Dr. Faust, thanks for being with us again. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you again, Tyler. 
Appreciate having you on. So at this time, uh, it seems that the COVID-19 pandemic has once again taken a different turn. It's given us something that's pretty interesting actually because the number of cases has uh, somewhat been, has somewhat increased, but we aren't seeing as great severity from these cases. However, with the case numbers that have amounted database, the COVID-19 database in Michigan showing oh, just under 16,000 uh, deaths from June of last year to June of this year, which is significantly more than the previously than the previous year. How does that impact? How, how has that been impacted by vaccines, by the changing variants, and why is it the case that with more deaths, which is the great concern with this virus in the last year versus the first year of the pandemic, isn't there greater cause for concern necessarily on a widespread level with shutdowns with? all the precautions being in place than previously in the pandemic. Wow, that's about 10 questions rolled into one. Um, so let me just say that it is a, um, it is a moving target. This is uh, continuing to evolve, not only the virus, but also our ability to manage it. Um, a couple things are going on right now. So we had been in an upswing. We had been all the way down to fewer than 100 average cases, new cases per day back in March. So just a couple months back, we got all the way up to um, an average of 600 cases a month later, so middle of May. And now we're trending downward again. So this is great news. We're right now about 200 average, over seven day average, 200 new cases per day. <clears throat> um, and you know we can, I think, um, attribute that to our ability to move meetings outside, having a whole lot of activities outdoors, to having better ventilation in general. If we do have meetings indoors, group meetings indoors. Um, but given that, um, the mathematical modeling projects that we will have a significant surge sometime late fall. So once schools are back in session, once colleges and universities are back in session, we have international students coming back into our colleges and bringing other variants in, um, we honestly have no idea, no way to predict what variants will be dominant at that time. So right now, the second Omicron variant is dominant throughout the state. <clears throat> um, but we have so-called BA4 and BA5 Omicron variants um, showing up in the state. And if they behave anything like they have uh, globally, they will become the new dominant variants. So we'll see how that goes. The good news is that even as they overtake and usurp the existing variants, the clinical severity of disease is no greater. And in fact, overall, as you point out, we have fewer hospitalizations. We have fewer severe complications from infections. And the fact is, most of the infections that we see right now are so-called breakthrough infections. That is, we have um, well over 80% across the county who have had at least one, um, one of the, the vaccine doses in the 12 and greater. And so most of us have some immunity. If you add to that the folks that have been infected with COVID-19, we have well over 90% have immunity in our community. So when we do get a breakthrough infection, the severity of disease is lesser. We have fewer hospitalizations, even for the same, a similar number of infections that we had say a year or two ago and we have um, many fewer fatalities. Having said that, I don't want to downplay the significance of this virus. We're still in a pandemic. It is not going away. And because it does evolve so rapidly, um, it um, mutates. We had more variants on the way. Um, we continue to battle this thing. And I think moving forward, we can, um, we can expect more boosters. Ultimately, we can expect, similar to influenza annual flu shots, we can expect the scientists at the WHO and CDC to look around and um, select 
a handful of the very worst variants and annually um, develop vaccines against those. I think that's where we're headed right now. Um, one of the things I, I hear is that um, you know, we, we now, as of last Friday and Saturday, we have CDC and FDA um, supporting the vaccine for um, six month to five year olds. This is a wonderful thing. And what I often hear is that while well, children are not that severely infected, they're not as often infected or symptomatic, but the fact is there are still children that die from COVID-19 infections. There are still children who um, have this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC, and there have been um, more than 8,500 children affected by MISC. And these are, these are potentially life-threatening um, complications from COVID-19 infection. They're potentially lifelong impact, you know, so-called long COVID, with severe disease. And so, yes, it's rare, um, much less common for children to be affected, but they certainly can be. And that's a great reason to get, to get children and, and infants vaccinated against this virus. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust, the medical director of the Oakland County Health Division, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You can keep up, up to date on COVID-19 information from organizations such as the CDC, the NDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division at the top of our page at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We provide you direct links to each and every one of those COVID-19 uh, organizations, COVID-19 specific web pages. Uh, as, as we continue on in, in the pandemic, one of the reasons uh, that COVID-19 severe outcomes, as you mentioned, such as hospitalization or uh, intensive care unit appearances haven't been as high of late is because of the working vaccines that are available out in the communities. However, these vaccines, they're not like the measles vaccine or the polio vaccine. They're not going, they're not, they aren't at this juncture capable of or meant to eradicate COVID-19. They're meant to, uh, to significantly impact the overall outcome of each case of COVID-19 among those that are vaccinated. With that being the case, what is it, uh, A, what is it about COVID-19 that makes this, that makes these vaccines the most effective outcome for this current disease? And B, where do we go with this if we're not going to eradicate COVID-19 to make it something that we can adjust to monthly, yearly, half yearly, or however it takes? I think, um... I think what we're up against is similar to influenza. We have a virus that um, mutates on a fairly rapid pace. And so it's difficult to keep up with that. And as it's mutating, it is um, those variants that are successful uh, at infecting us and being uh, at good at transmitting between human to human, um, those mutations are good at evading our immune system. And so the BA4 and BA5 variants that we have coming um, are actually uh, less uh, affected by the immunity from prior infections or from the vaccine. The immunity that we get from prior infections and from the vaccine helps reduce the severity of disease, keeps the blood level of virus down when we do get a breakthrough infection but it doesn't prevent infections as well as against the original or against um, Delta or against the original Omicron. And so, you know, moving forward, we will need to, this will be a, you know, a, um, this will be a battle and um, it will be a real arms race in terms of um, developing vaccines to keep pace with the evolving mutating variants of the virus. Um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't sound to folks as though we are not interested in eradicating this virus. We absolutely are. Unfortunately, I think because it is global and so widespread and because it is so good at, at mutating, um, it will become endemic in our species. And that is basically everybody will have some level of immunity against it. Those who are um, more vulnerable to severe disease and complications will need to be, you know, updated regularly with vaccination. And, um, and I should mention that folks really should have a sense of their vulnerability 
you know, their risk level, discuss it with their physicians and get vaccinated, get boosted, be aware and have a plan because even if you're fully vaccinated, have a plan for how to manage if you're especially vulnerable to complications, if you do become infected, that is where to go to get the therapeutics, the monoclonal antibodies and or the antivirals. And we do have access to those that we did not have a year ago or two years ago, and they make a huge difference for people. And, and so as you mentioned, the subvariants BA4 and BA5 are better equipped to escape the antibody responses of COVID-19, whether it be prior infections or be vaccinations uh, and, and so on. If that is the case, uh, in a, and, and those subvariants are going to be coming into our communities at some point, what, you know, what do the metrics then show? What do the, the statistical models that the medical community has been following to try to shoulder the load of some of these different variants and some of these surges, what are they showing in terms of the potential of these variants to have impact on our communities in Oakland County where, where uh, you serve, but also statewide? So the good news is, again, um, we do have such a, a great um, kind of across the board level of immunity right now. We have a foundation of immunity. Yes, there are pockets of folks that are kind of anti-vaccination um, and who are especially vulnerable, but in general, we have a very high level of immunity, whether that's from prior infection or from complete vaccination or a combination, because certainly being fully vaccinated does not prevent you from getting a breakthrough infection. Um, but we have such a level now, even though BA4 and BA5 and future variants have some mutations that reduce the recognition by our immune system, there is still recognition. Our immune system, our immunity that we have established now from vaccination does prevent the, the life cycle of the virus. It prevents it establishing very high blood levels so that yes, folks are getting infected, they're not experiencing the severity of disease and they're not being hospitalized and, and they're staying alive. I think the, the mathematical modeling suggests that um, we will not, we're unlikely to experience, at least in the foreseeable future here over the next year, we're unlikely to experience that sort of overwhelming crush of patients into our hospitals from the next surge. That is, there will be positive cases, people being infected, but not with the same severity, not flooding our hospitals. And I think that, you know, that's kind of the, the positive flip side of the this coin of mutating virus. We have established a great level of immunity now, which is going to keep us out of um, the same kind of trouble that we experienced a year ago. So if I'm translating that correctly, what yeah. you were saying is the case with the BA4 and BA5 subvariants and potentially the subvariants of, over, of Omicron that, that come forth beyond those, that they're most they're more likely to escape the precautions and, and escape the defenses, better yet, of antibody responses from prior infections or even from vaccinations or a combination of both. But they're not, but there's enough immunity in the greater community and the likelihood of those those variants, despite their better defenses on their part against some of these of some of these precautions are not all powering over these precautions. They just have a tendency in some cases to be able to jump the red line and infect an individual. That's a, that's a good paraphrasing. I think in general, there are so many antigenic points along the viral protein that, they, that our immune system recognizes. Even if they have multiple mutations, so we lose recognition of some of them, we still, our immune system still recognizes sufficient numbers of antigenic sites there that we prevent, um, that we prevent very high levels, blood levels of, of viral infection. Um, so yeah, we, there, there's, I mean, this is the reason to continue getting vaccinated, even though these vaccines are not made against BA4, BA5 because they're made against um, viral strains for which we develop an immune response. And, and despite that not being 100% recognizing BA4, BA5, it still recognizes sufficient sites on BA4, BA5 that it prevents 
um, us becoming severely in infected and ending up in the hospital and ICU. Enough to provide some defense, but maybe not as Thank you. full strength defense yeah. as previous variants or subvariants. Yeah. Okay, we're joined by Dr. Russell Faust. He is the medical director at the Oakland County Health Division. Joining us on the Michigan Megacast, you can get more information on COVID-19 from the Oakland County Health Division, including localized information if you are in Oakland County or living in Oakland County, as well as from other resources such as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Oakland and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our megacast link. Uh, Dr. Faust, uh, on a global level, no one wants to hear about another disease, about another disease that's being discussed across the world, but uh, it should be referenced that the World Health Organization met yesterday uh, to discuss whether they should determine monkeypox as a global health emergency. Um, can you explain to our audience just what monkeypox is, the seriousness of this issue within the medical community in, in Michigan at this time, and even beyond Michigan with discussions regionally and across the country in regards to monkeypox? Sure. Um, monkeypox is, as the name suggests, originated in monkeys, um, somehow has um, jumped the divide and ended up in some humans. Right now, as of June 17th, I don't have for the last couple of days, but as of last, the end of last week, the monkeypox um, cases in the U.S. are limited to around 100 cases, so 113 cases so far. So extremely rare. Um, the risk of transmission is remains low. So CDC is um, cautioning that um, if anyone has been exposed to someone with monkeypox, a known monkeypox case, um, they should be monitored. But the fact is, as of now, there are no cases in Michigan. Now, because of the, um, the media response and um, the fact that it is um, associated with a, a particular kind of rash, an iconic rash, um, there have been um, suspected cases, and those have been ruled out by testing. Um, I'm not sure what, what more to say, is, except that it's um, here in the U.S., it's an extremely rare event. And um, virtually all those people have been exposed through, uh, through traveling or exposed directly to someone who has traveled. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust, Medical Director of the Oakland County Health Division on the Michigan Megacast. Dr. Faust, another minute or so with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that the people of Oakland County and, and certainly the people of Michigan should be uh, keeping their focus on regarding COVID-19 or other medical issues or public health issues across the board? No, except to say that um, if folks, I, I, again, I wanna emphasize that people really should have a sense of their risk if infected by COVID-19 they should have a plan in place, have discussed it with their physician or their medical team, and really have a sense of where to go if they do become infected with regard to therapeutics, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals. To find out any of that information on that, they can call our nurse on call line, and that's 800-848-5533. And thanks again for inviting me, Tyler. Appreciate having you on, Dr. Faust, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a break on the megacast. Before we do take that break, I just wanna again reference the breaking news today that Roe versus Wade, the landmark, uh, the landmark Supreme Court decision uh, that, that permitted the right, federal right to an abortion uh, has been overturned by the US Supreme Court in a decision made on the case Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization uh, on Friday in a decision that had um, a majority affirmation, affirming votes and only three individuals uh, dissenting, all three that were nominated by Democratic presidents, those being justices, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan, all voting uh, in a dissenting opinion on this case. Of course, it was reported months ago that this was something that was oncoming as a draft decision by Justice Samuel Alito had alluded to 
Roe versus Wade soon to be decided on uh, in this case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization that has been overturned. We are wor working on getting Representative Andy Levin on. We had him scheduled to be on with us today to talk about a number of topics, including the potential for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now that is no longer a potential, that is a reality. It has been overturned as of this morning when the Supreme Court made a decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization that uh, ultimately overruled the decision in Roe versus Wade. And 11 is not yet with us. We're going to take a break and we'll try to con we'll continue trying to get him. He is headed to the Supreme Court, of course, uh, in reaction to this decision this morning to get more information and to do his job as a representative for the 9th Congressional District of Michigan. In the meantime, we're going to take a break. On the other side, we'll continue with more information all across the state of Michigan on interesting things and news and information you need to know about the Great Lakes State. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on Megacast, where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. You click on that link, it'll take you to MyMy's website at MyMyTV.com. M-Y-M-I-TV.com.
where you can learn more information about how you can access all of their free and original programming as well as imported programming from across the Great Lakes State on your smart TV, on your smartphone, and on the web for free. Their My Michigan TV apps for your smartphones and smart TVs can be downloaded anywhere. It's summer in Michigan, and when you're looking for fun shopping activities and even some people watching, you take one out of Petula Clark's playbook and you go downtown. One of Michigan's great downtowns is Berkeley, and joining us now is the Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority in Berkeley, Mike McGinnis. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, glad to have you on with us. So June, of course, is Pride Month, and Berkeley has a special celebration uh, coming up actually this weekend. It's an inaugural Berkeley Pride Block Parade, a block party, which will, uh, uh, which will be this Sunday, June 26th, from noon until 4 p.m. Tell us about this celebration uh, and this party and how people can participate. Sure. Uh, come one, come all. It is free and open to all. And in downtown Berkeley on June 26th and every day of the year, parking is free and parking is ample all throughout our downtown, which is uh, one mile along Coolidge and one mile along 12 mile. This particular uh, festival celebration, the first of its kind for our community, is on Sunday, June 26th, Berkeley Pride Block Party. And that is also a free event happening at Robina and 12 Mile, but also extending throughout the downtown businesses who have extended hours, have uh, promotions and features, and Pride-themed uh, merchandise and activities for the community to enjoy. This is Berkeley's first Pride event, the first uh, of this kind of celebration in Berkeley. Can you speak to the event's significance in Berkeley and why this was the perfect time, the perfect year to form a celebration and recognition of Pride Month? Yes, uh, to your very point, June is uh, LGBTQ plus Pride Month and our downtown volunteers that help make so many of our magical and special events happen. This was a priority for them and they helped us determine that we do these block party series all throughout the year, that this was the, the perfect time to have that downtown block party series marry, <laughs> to join the, um, the opportunity to have the first pride celebration for the community. It's been uh, a priority and interest for a lot of residents and we're glad to be able to meet this moment and have that uh, special event happen in our downtown. What's great about events like these is that they are often bringing recognition to LGBTQ plus organizations and individuals in the community who are doing interesting things or important things to help a community like Berkeley and its neighbors, Oakland County, uh, Lower Michigan, and surrounding areas. So what, who are some of the organizations, the LGBTQ plus organizations in particular, that will be participating in Berkeley's uh, Pride Month Black Party? There are a ton of free activities and entertainment in addition to DJ music throughout the whole event. There will be many different resource groups uh, that will have booths there. So Ruth Ellis Center, which uh, supports homeless LGBTQ plus youth, Affirmations Community Center, Free Mom Hugs, uh, Be Well Medical Center, and many others, uh, including Oakland University's Gender and Sexuality Center, Berkeley High School's uh, Gay Straight Alliance and, and other allied organizations. And there will be an entire area for kids crafts and activities, as well as complimentary face painting for children and adults alike. We should note uh, uh, that there's some controversy in the Berkeley area surrounding this event. Uh, Berkeley Councilman David Dennis Hennan opposed the black party and saying the following quote, it's my deeply held religious conviction that homosexuality is wrong. And to be clear that this is some sort this, and to be clear, this is not some sort of homophobia. For example, I feel equally about all kinds of sin and close quote. Your reaction to that and, and also the community or even better yet, the community's reaction to that in both the execution of this pride block party despite that opposition, but also Berkeley's, Berkeley's support of the LGBTQ plus community. Well, it did draw a lot of attention to the Berkeley Pride Block Party. So uh, not only did uh, the word get out throughout Metro Detroit, uh, but essentially every Berkeley resident is probably well aware of the Block Party it, it, it taking place in our downtown. Uh, and the, the response has been very overwhelming and very positive where the community is rallying around the Black Party and want to be a part of the, the celebration, which we are staging and focusing on making it be positive, uh, reaffirming, and a, a plus for the downtown uh, Berkeley 
and entire city of Berkeley landscape. Uh, we want to be a positive addition. That's why we exist uh, for the Berkeley Downtown Development Authority. And we think it very much achieves that and has been well received by Berkeley residents and neighbors accordingly. Well, Jordan Mike McGinnis, he's the executive director of Berkeley's Downtown Development Authority, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Their Berkeley Downtown, uh, the Berkeley Downtown Pride Block Party will be Sunday, June 26th, noon to 4 p.m. Uh, on Rubina, north of 12 Mile. It's free family fun. There's free parking all throughout downtown Berkeley so that you can attend again Sunday, June 26th, noon to 4 p.m. Uh, in, in downtown Berkeley. It'll be their Pride Celebration Block Party event. There's first Berkeley Pride Block Party. And Mike, do you imagine that uh, with the enthusiasm going into planning this event and execution of this event and the excitement that's built in Berkeley and surrounding areas for this event, that this will be a tradition now in Berkeley? That is our expectation, and that's been the groundswell. That's the chorus of, of feedback from Berkeley residents and the volunteers who were making it happen in the first place. But the way in which volunteers have come out of the woodwork to really want to uh, come through, make sure it happens, make sure it's successful. Uh, they are very adamant that they want this to be an annual uh, tradition for our community, which has many dynamic signature events. I mean, Berkeley really likes to have a good time and really uh, has a very full dance card all year round. And we're honored to be able to help expand that even further because it's an amazing community. It's a real destination and it's really well located in Metro Detroit. Uh, we have a lot of dynamic communities all around us and, and we are as part of that constellation excited that june 26 will be a destination this year and then uh pride happening in future years for our downtown as well we're joined by mike mcginnis executive director of berkeley's downtown development authority joining us on the michigan megacast mike the summer is such a critical time of the year for downtown areas which tend to be economic centers for cities like Berkeley and, and others all across the Great Lakes state. As at the point that we're in the COVID-19 pandemic with people being more comfortable, so to speak, to get back out in the community and participate in events and, and patronize our local businesses. How excited is the business community for this upcoming summer in terms of their ability to bounce back and return to some sense of normalcy despite the, the pandemic continuing on as it goes? Great question. We had our 20th annual uh, Berkeley Art Bash in mid-June, and by many accounts, it was the most robust, uh, positive, and high turnout uh, in the past two decades. It was really a big success. And uh, we, of course, have this Pride Black Party on June 26th, but then July 16th, we have a street art fest on Coolidge. August 19th, we have the Cruise Fest the night before. Uh, the Woodward Dream Cruise, which has been going on for over 25 years. We have Irish Fest in September. We, the Berkeley Downtown Development Authority, have brought forth the Bookley um, season during Halloween. So we want to support those downtown retailers and our small businesses all year round, not just a, a holiday shopping season. We want them to be able to have sustainable reinforcements and infusion of, of support and sales. We're joined by Mike McGinnis. He is the executive director of the Downtown Development Authority in Berkeley, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You mentioned all those fun events and initiatives that are going on all throughout the year in Berkeley, and uh, these are all the result of many projects that went on over the course of the pandemic and the work continuing to develop uh, Berkeley's downtown despite the crisis that we were in. What are some of the continuing developments that are being made in downtown Berkeley, whether it be strategic or uh, physical changes that are happening to the downtown area to continue to spark its growth into the future. Thank you for asking. We've invested a great deal of uh, resources and, and expanded um, furnishings to make downtown Berkeley more amenable to pedestrians, walkers, those wanting to you know stretch their legs, get out, have that outdoor opportunity. We have also expanded the investments in our public spaces through the pandemic, and it's still continuing. There's just a lot more people out and about in our downtowns uh, throughout Michigan. And we want Berkeley to be high on their radar and if they live nearby or they wanna make a special trip. So it's not just the signature events, uh, it is also making it pleasant all year round. We've expanded bistro seating outdoors, uh, quadrupled the number of benches along both miles of our road, uh, and also have built a new public space uh, between the city, the school district, and our Berkeley DDA uh, that is opening to the community as well. 
A lot of changes continuing in downtown Berkeley to continue to make it its its own unique downtown area and support the community as it gets back out into the community. We're joined by Mike McGinnis, executive director of Berkeley's Downtown Development Authority, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Again, their uh, Pride Month block party event happening on, on Sunday, June 26th. That's this week's Sunday, noon until 4 p.m. at Rabina and 12, just north of, tw of 12 Mile in downtown Berkeley. It's free, free family fun free event, free activities, and free parking all throughout downtown Berkeley. Again, noon to 4 p.m. Sunday, June 26, 2022. Mike, in addition to this event, what are some other fun events happening in Berkeley this summer that people should be keeping an eye out for? Mark in their calendars to attend. That's right. Uh, you can visit downtownberkeley.com or our Downtown Berkeley Facebook page to follow along. But we have the Street Art Fest, Ladies' Night Out, the Cruise Fest, the Irish Fest, the uh, Buckley Night season all throughout uh, September and October. And then we, we have our Holiday Lights Parade, Merry Month, Small Business Saturday at the end of November. I mean, there's just chock full of, of stimulation and activity. We're joined by Mike McGinnis. He is the Executive Director of Berkeley's Downtown Development Authority on the Michigan Megacast. Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And Downtown Berkeley looks forward to seeing you. DowntownBerkeley.com for more information on all their upcoming events, including this Sunday, June 26th, noon to 4 p.m. at Rabina, just north of 12 Mile in Berkeley for the Berkeley, uh, Berkeley's first annual Pride Block Party. Join them there Sunday, June 26th. That's this week's Sunday, noon until 4 p.m. We're going to take a break on the Michigan Megacast. On the other side, we will, con we will continue the program by talking to one of Michigan's numerous impactful charities and nonprofits. We'll be right back with more of the Michigan Megacast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus. Can I ask you a question? Uh why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. 
What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine to keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You'll find more information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now is one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform. Erica Murray is the development manager at Focus Hope. Joining us now on the Michigan Megacast. Erica, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate having you on. So first off, give us some insight into the background and into the services and resources provided by your organization. Sure. So one thing about Focus Hope, we're, um, we've been around for over 50 years. So we were basically founded in 1968 after the 1967 uprisings that happened in Detroit. Um, so our two founders, Eleanor Dracitis and Father Cunningham, were really like upset and wanted to be involved as to how can we um, address like injustice that was going on during that time and um, racism and overcome poverty. And so that's how basically Focus Hope has been um, founded. And we have four areas of focus that we uh, like to like uplift and everything. So we have our early learning program and our youth development program, which is in the same area that hosts like various um, programs like our doula program, His Start program, our Great Ready um, Start, uh, I think that's what it's called, Great Start Readiness program, um, our Photo Excel program that helps like kids learn how to take photography throughout the city during the summertime. Uh, we also have our workforce development um, uh, area where we have uh, partnerships with DTE, with tree trimming. Um, we also do robotics. Uh, we just kind of get people ready for that workforce. Um, we also have food for seniors where we provide food boxes to over 400 seniors in the Metro Detroit area. And, and our final piece that we really focus on is our advocacy, um, equity and community engagement, where we kind of give um, opportunities for teenagers in high school with our Generation of Promise program and also um, provide support um, to corporations as to how to tackle and be a voice in the community when fighting injustice and racism and whatnot. And so uh, all this information can be found, more information on these services, on these resources can be found on Focus Hope's website, focushope.edu. Erica, yes. uh, how do people, particularly for these critical resources that can help them in, in so many different ways, the individuals uh, and businesses and organizations that would like to access this information, how can they go about getting that gaining that access and gaining that partnership with an organization like yours? Yeah, so there's two different ways. You can always go through our website at focushope.edu, and also you can call us at 313-494-5500. Um, you will be able to get uh, directions as to who to, you need to contact to um, for our various programs that we offer. So talk to us about the, the uh, concept of the race equity lens and how that impacts the work that you and others do at Focus Hope. Yeah, it's something that was really, truly what founded Focus Hope. And so we always want to 
show up and be there when someone may be going through something um, that could be some type of injustice. Um, and so we truly focus on that piece. Um, we have our Eleanor March for Hope every year. And so that's something that we tackle, like we bring a light as to their different areas that we can focus on um, and whatnot. So like equity is something that we all know um, we need to like tackle as a country or even within the city. And so it's just kind of, we show up with like different um, research tools within like um, our program director for ACE, which is our accuracy department, um, Jason, he is very active as to finding key ways to tackle racism and injustice by providing these researches that are with like the state, um, U of M, um, within the city, Wayne State, um, just different ways on how we can be in the community and listen to the community as to what the needs are. We're joined by Erica Murray, the Development Director at Focus Hope, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Focus Hope, one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. You can find them in a couple of places. Focushope.edu is their website, focushope.edu, or you can visit Share Detroit's website at sharedetroit.org. Go to their Find a Nonprofit section and search for Focus colon Hope, and there you'll find more information on the organization's history, how you can visit their website, how you can get in contact with them, other opportunities and some of their necessities as well that you can help contribute to all on their website, focushope.edu or sharedetroit.org. Uh, Erica, as we continue on, there's so many great services and so many great programs that Focus Hope contributes to and provides in communities uh, in communities uh, in Lower Michigan. Can you talk about some of the communities that are aided by the work of the organization and uh, where people in those different areas can gain access to these resources? Yeah, sure. So we're, we're in four counties, all four of the um, Metro Detroit counties. So Wayne, Washtenaw, um, Oakland, and I can't think of the third one. Macomb is the fourth one. Um, and so we we cater to all of those. We sh um, we show up where you're where you're at, basically, um, and we provide like we we ask you questions as to where your needs and whatnot and to make sure that we're um providing the resources that you need um and you can again find us at focushope.edu um and also call us at 313-494-5500 to um contact um anybody in within those departments that you are in need of um so yeah <laughs> Providing these services, providing all these great programs to people uh, that your, ser your organization is serving and, and to the communities to serve the communities in this way. It takes a, a great effort from a, a large number of people. How, just, what sort of volunteer opportunities are available if people that are watching this or listening to this would like to help Focus Hope's cause and help them support people in their local area? Yeah, we have different um, volunteer opportunities. Um, right now, our highest need is deliver deliver drivers, uh, delivery drivers for our food um, for our home bound seniors that um that are in like a different apartment complex or who are just not able to pick up boxes but we always have volunteer opportunities and again you can find that on our website um there's a tab that says volunteers um and you can find more we also have um virtual reading opportunities for the kids um just different things help with testing for our workforce um and so this there's various opportunities are available. And again, you can find that on our website at focushope.edu. For those that may not have access to the internet or to technology that can access the internet or may not even be able to give Focus Hope a call, what are some other ways that they can go about accessing some of these resources and especially some of these services that are provided by Focus Hope? Yeah, um, that is a good question. We, our doors are always open. Um, you're more than welcome to come to 1400 Oakland Boulevard, which is also in Detroit. Um, we, if you are looking for services or whatnot, we always have um, something on campus that is available to those who are not able to um, call or not um, 
I do not have internet access. We're joined by Erica Murray, the Development Director at Focus Hope, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You can find more information on the organization, including volunteer opportunities and other ways you can help by visiting focushope.edu. That's focushope.edu, or by going to Share Detroit's website, where they're one of over 300 charities and nonprofits in Detroit and the metropolitan area in Lower Michigan. Uh, supported on the Shared Detroit platform, sharedetroit.org. In addition to volunteers, what are some other critical needs uh, at this point in time uh, for Focus Hope to continue its mission and continue to provide those critical resources to so many in our communities? Yeah, we're always looking for um, socks, to be honest. Uh, our seniors, are, they're always asking if, we, if they can have socks within their food boxes or just children books, children clothes, anything that is, um, you know, impactful for like our, these programs that would help those in need. Um, those are like just like some of our key. Um, of course, with the baby formula sh um, shortage, we're also looking for more uh, baby formula, um, just so that we can keep our babies uh, with their formulas um, when they're on our campus. Uh, it is the summer season. Schools are mostly out, or they will be out, if not very, if not now, very, very soon. And this is a time of the year where it's so important to keep kids engaged in activities and keep them focused, keep them learning. Also, what sort of resources are being provided this summer through Focus Hope for continuing education over the summer, or at the very least, continuing activity for kids and teens? Yeah, so a photo, uh, our Excel photography program, that's um, one of our summer activities. And I believe, I think that's like the main one that we have right now for the kids. Um, and those that's more so for like middle school, high school students. Um, for the younger kids, uh, there's not much for that right now, um, but there's always something with like the Detroit libraries and whatnot that they always offer um, resources. We're joined by Erica Murray, the Development Director at Focus Hope, one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform. She's joining us today on the Michigan Mecca Cast. You can find more information by visiting sharedetroit.org, where you can learn more about Focus Hope and over 300 other charities and nonprofits by navigating to their Find a Nonprofit section on their homepage. Search for uh, Focus Hope to learn more about Focus Hope or navigate through the search functions to find organizations uh, supporting many different causes and providing many different sorts of resources and programs all across Lower Michigan, sharedetroit.org. You can also visit Focus Hope's website directly at focushope.edu for more information on programs, resources, and how you can participate in providing these services and these programs and these other critical uh, critical resources to people all throughout the local area. Uh, Erica, just another couple minutes with you before we say goodbye today. Anything else that we haven't discussed that would be important for our audience to know or keep in consideration about focus hope at this time yeah there's always we're always looking for volunteers um if you're down and don't have anything to do especially with uh teenagers who are looking for um volunteer opportunities for um high school credits or whatnot um of course go to our website um and in october we also have our eleanor march for hope and we would love for um more community members to be uh, um, involved with that as well more information, focushope.edu. That's focushope.edu for more information, or you can visit sharedetroit.org to learn more about Focus Hope and over 300 other charities and nonprofits, sharedetroit.org. Erica, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate having you on. Again, focushope.edu is their website where you can learn more about everything that they're doing at Focus Hope. Uh, go on their website, learn more about early learning, youth development opportunities for adults, job training, food for seniors, and for the general community, learn more about the community and their advocacy work as well, how you can get involved with Focus Hope, volunteer with them, and of course, if you have the means to do so, and you can support them financially through donations of items, go uh, of goods, or of uh, monetary donations, we highly encourage you to do so as well. Focushope.edu is the website. You can also visit them on sharedetroit.org, as well as over 300 other charities and non profits right in the metro detroit area that is going to do it for this friday edition of the oakland county and michigan megacasts and that is going to do it for this week's editions of both of these programs as well you can always keep up to date 
on everything that we're doing at civiccentertv.com by clicking on our megacast link. There you'll find information on every single one of our partnering stations. We are a daily, five days a week, live one, uh, one uh, two hour program dedicated in the first hour of the program, 10 a.m. to 11 o'clock to the people and the places and the events and things happening in Oakland County and then the 11 o'clock hour to things all across the state of Michigan. Uh, and you can find us each and every day on a number of, of community television and radio stations, as well as on web outlets, such as our web flagship, My Michigan TV, and they have other great original programming as well. We highly encourage you to go to our website at civiccentertv.com, click on that megacast link at the top of our homepage on your computer web browser and on some mobile devices, it'll also be at the top of the homepage, but on others, it'll be in a drop-down menu on the left side of the screen. You, you click on that drop-down menu, you scroll down to megacast, you click on that link, and on that page we have all links are going to each and every one of our other partnering stations. So you can learn more about the other programming they do in the 22 hours of the day, five days a week that they're not with us live for the Oakland County and or the Michigan Megacast. You can also find all of our programs and each individual interview on demand and watch them at your leisure, civiccentertv.com slash megacast or by going to My Michigan TV's website at mymytv.com where you can also find us on demand there as well. And learn more about their free apps for your smartphones and your smart TV. You you can always watch the megacast from home on the big screen by going to the my michigan tv app on your smart tv you can download it for on many different smart tv apps and learn more information on mymytv.com that's mymytv.com we can also learn more about taking my michigan tv on the road with you with one of these puppies here on your mobile phones your smartphone apps for for my Michigan TV are also free. Take Michigan content for free with you anywhere in Michigan, out of Michigan, and around the world with the My Michigan TV app. More information, mymytv.com. I want to give a big thank you to everybody that joined us on this edition of the Megacast, as well as all of our editions of the program this week, and give a big thank you to our entire crew, Calvin Brown and Jerry Clark at Master Control at the office of My Michigan TV, our technical director, and our Zoom producers on this edition of the Megacast, as well the king of television himself, Larry Nylon, our producer of each and every episode of the Megacast, helping both us and each one of our guests be, in, uh, be ready for informative conversations on a number of topics all about you, the state of Michigan. We'll return on Monday with new editions. In the meantime, on My Michigan TV, coming up next, it is Steve Lato live, followed by Larry and Ronnie live. Again, we'll return on Monday with new editions of the Oakland County and Michigan Megacasts.